Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it's a real honor for me to be here. You're the future, and I want to hear what you guys think. I want to hear what's important to you. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to talk about collaborations. I'm going to talk about sustainability. I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done. But along the way, ask questions um, because y you're, you're, you have different interests than maybe I'm aware of. And so if there's something that strikes you, feel free to, to let me know because I want to I understand more about what you care about because you have different areas of design you're in and we'll touch on different things but it might not be exactly your area. You might want to steer me towards something that really is relevant to you. Let me ask this, a raise of hands. How many people have ever heard of the name Emico before tonight? Okay, not many. All right. Um, how many people have seen the Navy chair? Um, so this, this uh, picture, I have no idea who it is. But tonight, what I'd like to do is talk about why someone would tattoo this chair on their leg. What about it? What are those, those hidden values? What emotional connection did they have to compel them to put this on their leg? So I want to go through and talk to you a little bit about the company. And let me, let me just, I'll go through some of our history and a little bit to kind of give you an idea of all the values that are in it. One of, one of the, the values we have for the company is our heritage. Uh, the company started in 1944, World War II. And they, the Navy had a problem. Anything on a ship, it has to be lightweight because ships, the, 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 the weight above the waterline causes ships to roll. So they need a lightweight. They're out at sea. So they needed something that was salt air impervious to that. They, they couldn't have a fire, so it had to be fireproof. And it had to be non-magnetic so it wouldn't affect the instruments. And finally, the, the big burly sailors would tear apart anything on the ship. So it had to be really durable. In fact, this chair, this, this Emico chair, was, this is the, the chair that was made. It was so durable, it became standard issue for all the, all the government facilities, whether they were all the warships, aircraft carriers, destroyers, uh, submarines. This was the chair. But it was also used in the government libraries in the prisons. I mean, in, now you see the movies. Whenever you see this chair, it's always in the bad guy scenes. You'll see this chair in interrogation rooms. This is the chair, and it's the, the authentic chair that was used for that application. So this, um, this, this, this uh, company, Emico, it, uh, it grew. And it had trains pulling into the factory, loading up the trains, and they would deliver these 10,000 chairs to a ship to fill up a ship. But there was one problem. The problem was the company had one chair and they had one customer, the government. And as the Cold War ended and the military stopped ordering chairs, there was no customers left. And they would, they would take submarines and they would scrap out all the metal They'd, they'd keep the chairs and they would sell the chairs or they'd put them on something else. So here you had a, a, a chair that's made with 20 per, or 80 percent recycled material and it's tested to last 150 years. So it's indestructible. Um, so it was, it was kind of a, a big problem. So let me, let me take you sideways a little bit and, and tell you the story and how the story goes. And part of it is there's this guy, and it's me, and I grew up surfing, and I, I used to surf every day before school, high school. My mom used to say I used to surf all day and didn't go to high school. Um, and I really had a love for the ocean and the environment. My mom was a designer, and she got all the magazines, and so I used to read Domus magazine, and I, I learned who some of these people were, uh, Itori Satsas, and 
he started a movement called Memphis and some crazy things he did. And, and um, she really uh, encouraged me to be creative. And my dad was an engineer and he designed for furniture companies understructures of chairs. And there was a designer, Charles Eames, and he would design the understructure of some of his chairs. And when they were done, they'd go to trade shows. And when the trade shows were done, they would give these rejects to my dad. And now they're prototypes. And so I grew up in this mid-century modern house full of reject furniture. And it was an amazing environment of design and engineering and a love for the environment. So that's this weird combination of this, this military company and this guy that comes in. Um, there's a guy named Mo Rocca. You might have heard of him. He came and he did a, a little film. It, it was for CBS this morning. Let me, uh, let me show you what this uh, film is. Chairs roll off the line into the world and under backsides everywhere. You know the chair, even if you don't know its name. The Emigo Navy Chair. It's the star of screens big and small, supporting more than just Hollywood heavyweights. Britney Spears danced with, on, around, even under an Emigo chair for the music video for her pop anthem, Stronger. in offices, restaurants, ballparks, and airports around the globe. Today, Emico chairs are everywhere. But it all started with just a single customer. It's this American iconic chair from the 40s during the war effort. It was four Navy ships. It was lightweight. It was non-corrosive. It was fireproof. It wasn't about design. It wasn't about style. It was about a purpose. Dozens of craftsmen manufacture the Navy chairs in a 77-step process. Aluminum is bent, twisted, stamped, and soldered. The pieces are assembled, the edges ground down, the surface buffed. But what comes next is perhaps most important. This is a hardening process. Oh my gosh, and he's got to wear that because of the heat. Did you ever see that movie Outbreak? Oh yeah, yeah. That looks like that. sound is not in sync. But the company that makes it almost yeah. didn't survive into this century. One chair, one customer. So that was that was a big problem for Emico. As the, the war effort started to wind down, the Navy stopped needing chairs, and that was our business. If you're making something that lasts a very long time, what? well, is this, people aren't going to need to buy more unless you find more people. customers. Right. CEO I didn't open Greg it on here before. Says uh, a chance running with designer yeah, Felipe I think Stark it works, led to a successful know, collaboration and a rebirth for the company. The chair become more than the chair because it, it become a movement. Stark put a new light on it. It took this chair that looked retro and all of a sudden it looked modern. And it was really basically the same. Okay, this is ridiculous. It's uh, a. <laughs> it, the, the, the film and the audio are not in sync for some reason. Uh, my apologies. So let me continue on, and I hope the other eight films we're doing aren't as bad. Uh, anyway, um, here's the factory. I visited the factory um, in 1998, and it was pouring rain. There was a skeleton crew. The, the, the craftsmen were pretty... Uh, disgruntled. They knew one day that uh, any day 
the, the company would be closing. Uh, there just wasn't work there. Um, but as I walked around the factory, I could see good bones. It, it's like, you know, maybe if, if you guys have seen an old beat up car and you know you could do something with it. I knew I could do something with this factory. And as I walked around and I saw, you know, I saw what these craftsmen were doing, I saw the heart, I saw the, the, the incredible environmental qualities of this chair, I saw the simplicity in design. It was everything I grew up with. It was all, it was all in this one chair. And at that point, I, uh, I, I, I just started to think, God, I wonder, wonder what the possibilities are. And I went into the front office, and there was a lady on the, on the phone, and she was a Russian lady, and she said, no, I will not ship your chair. You send the money first. And, you know, here's a company that's barely struggling, treating a customer like that. I said, Paulina. I said, who was that? And she said, oh, some guy, Giorgio Mani. And I said, wow. I said, and I looked through the file cabinet, and I realized there were a few architects that had discovered who we were. And so I decided that, you know, I was going to make a go and make this chair, um, you know, see if, I, see if I could find a market, a new market, a market with designers and architects to specify the chair. So I um, decided to go to New York City to uh, a trade show called ICFF, International Contemporary Furniture Fair. And I went there and I ran into a guy, his name is Philip Stark. He's about the most famous designer on the planet. He designs Steve Jobs' yacht, he designs hotels, he designs uh, toothbrushes, you name it. This guy, he's a phenomenal designer. Um, he's from Paris and I was walking down the trade show and I, I saw Philippe Stark and I was staying at the, the Paramount Hotel which he designed and they used, they used the, he used this chair and I said, you know, Mr. Stark, I said, I love what you did at the Paramount Hotel. He said, oh? And he said, who are you? I said, I'm Greg from Emico. You used our, our Navy chair. He said, oh, what do you do for them? And I said, well, I own the company. And he said, you? He said, I thought it would be a bunch of old Navy guys. And he said, I've always dreamed of doing a chair for you. And he said, uh, let's do a chair. So we, he drew up all these sketches he had been thinking of, and we, we started to uh, uh, talk about it. And then we started to make chairs. And when, when here's where it gets interesting. Um, he would do a sketch, and we would weld up whatever it was. And then I would travel wherever he was in the world, and he would mark up the chair, oh, this, this a little flatter, this a little bit, this leg like this. And we would go back and forth. We probably did 50 of these things before we finally got, got it down. Um, so then he said, you know, I want, it, I want it to be shiny. I want it to be bright and shiny. And I was, tr you know, we would we would polish and try it. It would be kind of a little brighter, but not really bright and shiny. And someone said, "Oh, you could powder coat it." Someone said, "You could plate it." But all those finishes, they don't last. And environmentally, they're kind of sucky. So I wanted something that really was right for Emico. Um, and I went to the, we our neighbors there are Harley Davidson. And I went over there and I took one of these chairs and I said, "Hey, can you guys?" help me figure out how to polish aluminum. And this guy took, takes me back and he picks up a chair and, and, he's, and I'll show you what polishers look like. So here they are, on, but this is actually at the Emico factory now. And these are the back of chairs, but these big lathes and they spin. And when you take this chair and you see these guys and they're just, they're taking these things and they're going Neow, and, and all of a sudden it changes it changes the surface from this dull. It, it, nothing's applied to this. This is just the material. And it's just from, you know, compound and, and just muscle and sweat and effort. And that's, this is what's produced. And it was just like, I was shocked. I was like, wow, that's amazing. So we, we finished this extraordinary looking beautiful chair. I mean, just amazing chair. And we get an order. 
It's a hotel that Stark is doing. 1,000 of these chairs for this hotel, Hudson Hotel, New York City. I'm really excited except for one thing. It takes eight hours per chair to do it. And we don't have anybody to do it other than, you know, a guy at Harley Davidson that did it on a Saturday for me. So I ended up hiring four guys from Harley Davidson to set up our polishing shop. And um, we never would have finished this job in time. It's just the hotel, it opened up late. So we, we got it done. So Stark and I met at this uh, really great hotel in New York City called Mercer, and we're having a drink. And he's going, OK, Greg. He said, let's talk about how to market this chair. OK. He said, Milan. What's in Milan? Milan is the biggest furniture trade show in the world. It's the most important place to be. He said, if you want to compete, that's, that's where we have to be. I said, Philippe, I said, I don't have the budget for, for that. He said, no, 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 we'll be parasites. We will, we'll, we'll do a truck and we'll drive around the city and we'll have a picture of the chair and it will flip and it will say, heritage against recycling. I said, you know, he's French. He doesn't always get the words right. I said, heritage against recycling? He said, yeah, yeah. He said, when you make something so well, you never have to recycle. I said, oh, you know, I like that. So. He, uh, we got the truck, and this guy would, I, well, Stark, he, he's designing for all these furniture companies, and he gave a list. Here's where I'll be all these nights, and he wanted the truck to be parked right in front of the party. So, I mean, here's the party, he's getting paid by these companies to do their work, and he's got this parked in front. I mean, it was really embarrassing, but, you know, that's what's, it, so as designers, have fun, be creative. It's, I love working with Stark because he's just, he's a crack up and he really, he, he doesn't take things so seriously and he does things like this and it's, it's you, you have to bring that to a manufacturer because it makes it, it makes the whole experience more fun. Um, so Stark did something like, if you look at these two chairs and afterwards you want to come up and look at them, same seat, same legs. All he said, he said, I didn't design anything. I just made it more neutral. I just washed it. And, but what he did was, was so important. What he did is he took it from, he took a military industrial produced product and he made it a design product. With subtle little things, he was able to do that. It was, it was actually doing less and making it less design and it, it has really changed the company. So we're now a, one of the most well-known design furniture brands because of this little, this, this little thing right here. So sometimes it's not a loud voice. It's just subtle, but it, it really, it's super important. Um, the next designer we work with was, uh, here in Los Angeles, Frank Gehry. And Frank Gehry had ordered um, 125 of the Stark rolling office chairs in, in, in brush finish. And I went to his offices and decided to see the installation, started walking around the offices. And there's Frank Gehry. And I see him. I said, Mr. Gehry, I said, uh, I'm Greg from Emico. And I said, can you tell me why you used the Emico chairs here? And, and it, what he has is a large, large area where they're building gigantic models of all the buildings they're doing. It's just phenomenal. And he says, hot glue gun and exacto knives. And I said, what? And so one of his associates said, yeah, we, 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 we destroy all of our stuff. And this was just an indestructible chair. That's why we picked it. And so Frank says to me, he says, hey, I want to show you something. And we walk over into his office and he says, Tell me what you think of this chair. And it's an aluminum chair, and, and um, it, it, it had a nice look to it. And it, it was obvious Frank designed it. I said, it's, it's, it's attractive. And you know, it, I picked it up, and it was, it was really heavy, like our chairs. They're really light. And um, I said, it, it's kind of heavy. And I sat down, and ours has kind of this form bottom, and it's pretty comfortable. And I said, you know, it's not really very comfortable. And, then I looked at how it was constructed, and it's all these component parts that are connected. 
And in a product, any product, especially furniture, what fails first are the connections. The connections are the first thing that go. This chair has no connections. It's all one piece in the process that we make it. And that's what makes it such, gives it such a long life. And so after I made that comment to Frank, he looked over and he said, let's do a chair. So I'm going to attempt to start to show you this next film, but I have a feeling that it probably will work out like the last one. So let me give you a little flavor of it, then we'll go on. I this nutty passion to do a six-pound chair for years, and we were never able to do it. And this gets close. It's a structural thing. It's a structural purity that it doesn't take much to hold somebody. And uh, if you can make it very light, uh, it makes the, the use of it a lot more palatable, a lot, more, a lot easier for a lot of people. Chairs like this move, they feel precarious, but this one doesn't. That's what's nice. It feels secure. And this is based on a very early sketch I made. So doing a chair, as you know, is the hardest thing. It involves engineering. I always wanted to make a chair that's always one thing. If the decoration and the structure are all the same thing. So one thing I think you all noticed was the, the random sketches that Frank Gehry does. I mean, that's not the design. That's the starting point. And Frank Gehry calls it ping pong. And you saw all the different iterations back and forth and back and forth. And I've never done a chair where I've got a CAD drawing and we produce a chair and it's done. 
Um, that work, when you go back and forth, it's not just refine it. You're, you're learning every step. So again, from a design standpoint, plan on lots and lots of getting, the more you can get close to the material and you go back and forth and back and forth, you, you, it gets better and better and better and better. So it's, it's, it's a process we use and it's been, it's been a really good process and that's what Frank Gehry brought to our company. Um, here's what the chair looks like done. It's a really comfortable chair. Now architects and designers, they're competitive, as you guys probably know. Um, the next architect we worked with was uh, an architect by the name of Sir Norman Foster, knighted, and he's designed airports and bridges, and he's one of the top architects in the world. And um, he said, Greg, I, I want to have the minimum of material and the maximum strength. He said, from an ecological standpoint, it'd be the best. And here we are, we're in London, and that, that's the chair hanging from the wall. It's called the 2006. And he said, but I want to make it lighter weight than Frank's super light chair. So that was, that was kind of fun to, uh, to have that as an assignment. But the problem with the chair was we used really thin legs and, and, it, and to one of the most important things to an architect selecting a chair for a project is it's got to be safe. People can't fall and hurt themselves. So, you know, the reaction we got was always the same. This chair won't hold some of the people that come in here. So we always had that kind of comment. So finally, I, I, I went out into the uh, factory. I stacked up a thousand pounds of bags, of sandbags, and then I sat on top of it. The way we construct the chairs, they make, they, they ma it makes the chair so strong. And, and, um, you know, it passes all the testing, but I think people visually would see that chair and, and wouldn't think it would hold weight. So this obviously told them it would, it would hold plenty of weight. Um, here's, here's a designer, and he's one of the most important people to Emico. He came to the United States in the 50s, and, and I met him when he was in his 80s. And uh, he's a phenomenal person. But let me give you a, this, this short film about him so you know who this guy is. Um, he's starting to have, like, people are discovering his stuff more and more now. So you, you might have heard of him, but you'll see more and more of him as time goes on. His name is Ettore Satsas. The life and times of Ettore Sotsas. Ettore Sotsas loved to paint, but trained as an architect like his father had wanted. That didn't stop him drawing, though. He always used it as a way to think through his hands. He always carried a camera, too, shooting everything from walls, hotel rooms, doorways, and kitchens. He wanted to remember and understand the world, but it probably wasn't his sketching, painting, or photography that you remember him for. It was his design. He was one of the major forces behind the flood of design that came out of Italy after the war. His first big break was with Olivetti. When Sotsas came along, electronics was a serious business. The machines were large, cold, and scary. Ettore made them fun, friendly, and sexy. His Valentine typewriter became an iconic pop product and won him loads of prizes, too. But he got bored with Olivetti and mass production and took off for India to find out more about life. What he discovered there was colour and emotion. He loved the way that even poor people wore bright colours and had bright homes. These colours stayed with him for the rest of his career. Later he went off to America and to the ideas of pop art, Warhol and the beat generation. He returned to Italy determined to shake things up. Even in his 60s, he was unstoppable. After a night of Bob Dylan Records, he formed the Memphis Group. The group's fluorescent colors and squiggly shaped furniture would make him internationally famous. Sotsas said, Memphis is like a very strong drug. You cannot take too much. It's like eating only cake. Sotsas loved architecture and objects. His buildings could make you smile. His objects could make you laugh. 
One of his favorite objects was an Emico Navy chain. He was one of the first designers to use it out of its usual context. They were designed to be used on Navy ships, schools and prisons. Etel used them on his luxury Amazon Express yacht. Other designers soon followed the trend. It was his use of the Navy chair that brought him to meet Emiko. Ettore told them he wished he'd design the Navy chair. They both agreed that Ettore should redesign it, and that's what he did. Now, not many people get to see the big 9-0, but Ettore did. His last chair was even named after this monumental milestone. Its brightly colored, friendly seats took its inspiration from his own Navy chair back home in Milan, with his bright orange cushion on it. As Ettore said, a chair must be really important as an object, because my mother always told me to offer my chair to a lady. We think his mother would have been proud. Okay, so Ettore Satsas, um, every year since the time Stark got me started in going to Milan, I've gone to Milan every year, and I would see Ettore Satsas and have an espresso. And, and one year he said, you know, Greg, he's, I'm 87. He said, I, uh, we, we need to get started if we're going to get a chair done. So I started going to his apartment um, in this really very great area of Milan. And um, he kept, you know, he, really his mind was sharp. His body was failing. And he would say, no, we're going to put the structure underneath and weld underneath, and then we, can, we don't have to clean up the welds. It will be more affordable, and then we'll, we'll make the seat out of this material so it's softer. And, and I'd go back and forth, and there was one chair he was designing this arm for, and the arm, we couldn't get that tight bend. Every time we took it in the shop and bent it, we would crack the aluminum. And then we would try again, and we would dent the aluminum. We, and I'd come back and say, you, Ettore, we can't, we, we could do it with maybe, we can cut it and weld it. And he said, no, 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 I want it in one piece. I want it bent. And I said, we could do a, a you know, a, a, some other kind of uh, aluminum cast. And, and he said, no, no, one, one piece. And one day I came in and I had a, a chair. It's on his kitchen table. And he had a, a helper who would help him out of his bedroom. And he had our Navy chairs in his home that he would, would use. And... I had a sheet over this project we were working on, and I said, I have a surprise for you. And here's what I showed him, and this is the arm. We finally figured out how to get that arm, that curvature right. And he looked over, and he had tears in his eyes. And you know, he said, you've captured the humanity. He said, I, that's what I want. He, in one time at, when I was first showing this, my daughter looked over, and she said, it looks like a hug. And, um, so I don't know if that's what he meant by the humanity, but kind of when you look at, at this chair, what he saw in the original Emico chair, you don't normally see in metal. You don't see a smoothness. And he said you, get, you have warmth in it. And so he saw that the way this was made, and it inspired him. And there's something about this, this, this smooth curvature that, that got his inspiration going for that arm that he, he wanted to make. So we went on from there, and we did a really important project for us and, um, with uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola had gone to the Museum of Modern Art, and they, um, they talked to the, the head curator, Paolo Antonelli, and they said, you know, we have a problem. We have uh, these plastic bottles that are the best thing to deliver our be beverages in, but they're filling up the landfill, millions and millions of these bottles. And we have to find a way to use this material. And we're thinking if we can have some kind of design object made from this material, it could be a symbol. It could, in, it could inspire people to use this material. And she said, you know, a chair is a real important object for designers and architects. And a chair that's made out of aluminum right now is a, a company called Emico, you should talk to Greg. So they called up and said, would you guys be interested in making a chair out of this material? And first I, w I was skeptical because I didn't want to do a promotional chair. And they, they assured me, no, this wasn't a promotion. This is a real important cause. 
And so we ended up doing this chair, and it's, uh, it's called the 111 chair. And I'll, let me read what it says on the bottom because I don't remember what it says. So on the bottom of the chair it says, the 111 Navy chair. When you recycle a plastic bottle, you're doing something good. When you recycle 111 of them, you're doing something great. Help your bottle become something extraordinary again. So we did this and it, it took us four years to develop it and get the material right and make it structurally sound and, and really launch the product. Here's, here's what the raw material looks like. It's these bales of plastic bottles and uh, we've kept 18 million of them out of the landfill so far. But more importantly, we've inspired hundreds of other companies to use the material for, for, for their use. Um, companies like Adidas have called us up and, and so we get calls all the time and we share information, we tell them what we did, we tell them who we work with because the whole goal is to try to make the planet better and to use these materials. And as designers for a company like me, we need ideas on use of waste materials. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is the future and for, so for us, that's, that's what we work on and that's what we look at is how can we use waste materials in a smart way. Um, and we're always trying to do better. But in doing this project, it kind of brought me back to an old project. And in 2001, Philippe Stark said, you know, Greg, you're not going to be able to compete making aluminum chairs because um, they're so time consuming and labor intensive. You should try a plastic chair. And he designed a chair in 2003. And it was a plastic chair. And this had aluminum piece that fit in. And by the time we were done designing this thing, it was more expensive than the all aluminum chair, one. And two, I couldn't find any material that was recycled. I, everything that I was on the market at the time, I had to use petroleum-based materials. And I wasn't willing to do that. So we put this you know, on the, uh, on the burner, on the back burner, and, and didn't do anything with it. But I want, uh, here's a, a film of Stark. Actually, we shot this in Long Beach. He was here for a TED Talk. And, it was really funny because he was sweeping the factory floor. But this part I want to show you because it's the message and it's the purpose behind this product. All my life I have tried to find the essence, to find the minimum, to find the spirit. With this new chair, I start to feel happy because it's made of nothing. There is a guy, a humble guy, who takes a humble broom and start to clean the workshop. And with this dust of nothing, he makes a new magic. I love this broom, I love this chair, because Ms. Andero said a long time ago, less is more. With this chair we can say less and more. Because we choose to make less, less style, less design, less material, less energy, and finally, we are more. Thank you. So as designers, the other thing that's really important is the ability to, com to communicate. Stark is incredible. He can get up after a long night out somewhere and show up to a press conference and talk for an hour with no notes. And he's incredible. So. Um, this is the chair that he designed. It's called Broom, and it's made with 90% uh, factory waste. Really comfortable. It stacks. It's a very, it's a, it's just, it's just really good design. Um, and here's a project that it was used in. It's uh, the Biomuseo 
It's a project in Panama. So this brought together three different people I collaborated with. Uh, Frank Gehry did the building. Bruce Mao did all the exhibitions inside. And then the chairs, the little green things there, that's the broom chairs. And it's great because this, this museum is about biodiversity and, and eco, e ecosystems. And um, it's just a great place for it to be. It's, it fits the, the, the location really well. Um, the next, the next project I'll share with you is, is an interesting one by a company called Nendo. The uh, head of Nendo, head of design, is O.K. Sato. O.K. Sato is 36. You will hear a lot about this guy. He is doing, he's working on 400 projects all at one time. He works 24-7. His, his amount of, of projects and the scope of who he works with He's working with the best fashion companies. He's working with the best furniture companies. He's working, you name it, he's doing it. And uh, he's truly an amazing designer. I'm Oki Sado of Nendo from Tokyo. Uh, I'm uh, here in Milan to present my Su Stuo from Emiko. Su means simple or basic or point zero basically. Demico is about providing tools for architects and interior designers and uh, I think uh, Sue is really in line with that. The idea was about making a stool that goes in line with uh, the typical Navy chair, the icon of the Emico brand. What we wanted to use from the Navy chair was basically the contour of the seat which is what creates the comfort even though it's a metal seat and also the profile of the legs which has very flat surfaces but it has curves as well which creates the visual softness of the chair working with Amico was almost like working with an Italian company um, there's Greg who is in charge of everything he decides everything and then there's Magnus who is in charge of product development and so we just discussed everything together, and uh, it's, it's also simple. Greg showed me a list of materials, eco-friendly materials that we could use, and we were supposed to choose maybe one or two out of these materials. And we said, why don't we do all of them? And Greg got a little bit scared because he didn't want a, a warehouse filled with stools. So we had to come up with another idea, which was taking off the seat from the legs, but not in a really technical way, but using a single coin. It's a single screw that connects the seat and the legs together. And I think the coin is the thing that creates the friendliness and the peace. So in that sense, I think it is a very Nendo piece as well. So the customer can decide the finish or the materials of the seat and the legs. The legs, we have three different finishes and three different heights. And by taking off the seat, we can stack up the legs as well. We are presenting the plastic, the reclaimed oak from barns in Pennsylvania. We have the concrete. We have the aluminum and the mat and the mirror finish. And uh, the cork as well. And in the future, we're thinking about leathers or upholstery, things like that as well. So I think this is not about just designing a single piece of furniture, but it's more like a system that we can develop in the future as well. So uh, this, this happens to be old barn wood. The, the Emico factory is in Hanover, Pennsylvania. It's close to Lancaster, and there's a, an Amish guy that does a lot of our woodwork. And he takes down old barns, 200, 300-year-old barns, and he makes these seats for us. And um, you can see, I mean, with the wormholes and, and everything, and they're, they're spectacular. I mean, it's just it's great to repurpose things that you have that are you know, going away and doing it in a way that, that I think can be useful again. So, you know, that's, this is another example of how we work and, and this is a great project to be able to work in all kinds of different materials. The last project that I'll show you uh, is what we did last year. The designer, his name is Jasper Morrison and Jasper 
really understood Emiko, uh, the simplicity, the humbleness, the durability, the comfort, it's all there. This is a bench, but we make chairs and everything else. Here's Jasper, and it's an exhibition he just did in, in Cologne. It's just such a simple chair, and those little holes in there when it's in the chair, it's to pick up the chair, and here's, here's the chair here. And so uh, after I'm done, if you're interested, come up and, and, and sit down in the chair. It's just it's super comfortable. And if you look at the, you know, the woodwork, it's from, from the Amish guy. And it's engineered, though. So it's engineered so these legs pass BIFMA. You won't see another wood chair like it. Um, and the wood is made from ash. And the ash trees in the area in the east, they're attacked by this beetle called the ash elm beetle. But the wood is the same wood as they've used on like Louisville sluggers. It's super hard, great wood. So we've, we've used it here on, on these chairs. Um, and the plastic is 100% recycled plastic. So every time we do a chair, we get just a little bit smarter, a little bit better, always trying to lower the carbon footprint, always trying to, to, to make a better product. And that's, that's it. That's, you know, and again, I don't know who did this. Someone that we inspired. And partly what I love when I see things like this is I, I think m our goal is to make a difference. And to make a difference by inspiring people to make the planet better. And that's, that's kind of some of the hidden values you've heard about Emico. So I will open it now for any, any further, any, any questions or any thoughts? Yes? How many chairs do you currently produce? Uh, we have, how many, the question was how many chairs do we produce? Or how many styles? Styles? Well, we only do one new collection every year. We do that because most companies will do, you know, a whole bunch of them, like at least 10. It's because they want to see what, what sells, what doesn't sell. We just put all our eggs in one basket and say, let's just do the very best job we can. And so over the last 15 years, we probably have introduced 14 collections. So we, we probably have something like that now from one chair. Are, they, um, are all those chairs under your brand, or do you produce chairs for other companies? So the question was, do we, we produce only a, uh, our brand or other companies? Just, it's just, everything's just Emico. That, that's only under our brand. Yes? Um, if you could collaborate with an architect um, if, you know, currently, is there somebody you have in mind? OK, the question is, if I could uh, collaborate with an architect, is there somebody I have in mind? You know, it's it's interesting question, because there's two points of view. One is personal, um, like working with Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry, I would never, ever exchange that experience. He is so smart. He's an incredible guy. He walks me through uh, and he talks to me about all these buildings and what he's doing. He takes me out sailing on his boat. I mean, I have learned so much from that guy, but his chairs don't sell. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, from a personal standpoint and from challenging our company, never would trade that experience ever. But I have to keep the guys busy in the shop. So when you say, what architect would I choose? You know, architects are really good at buildings. They're not always great on chairs. Um, so it's, it's that trick. Now, let me, let me talk to you, because I think this is an important lesson. Philippe Stark knows chairs. Philippe Stark, when he says, Greg, I want you to pack up your backpack. We're going to climb Mount Everest. Here's what to load up. Here's long, how long it's going to take us. And this is what we're going to do. Frank Gehry says, Greg, we're going to hop in the rocket ship. We're going to go somewhere where nobody's been before. OK, as students, students want to do something that nobody's done before. Y y you know, it's, it's great. It's noble. But the reality is, if you want to be, have a successful product, you need to look around and realize what the market is. And if I want to sell chairs, I'm going to hire Philippe Stark. If I want to go on a fun ride in a rocket, I'm going to work with Frank Gehry. So I mean, it, it kind of goes like that.
Yes. What were you doing? What were you doing before you were at Emico? Emico is working with with uh, Kedia and uh, at JBI, and it's a company in Long Beach, and design work. Uh, we have designers and we fabricate. So I've always been around fabrication and building things. And you know, my dad was an engineer, and he, he it was all about fabrication. So it's I got a, a great learning experience being in that kind of environment. I'm sorry, you. The question was, how did I become the CEO? Well, it's funny, not too long ago, I was the president and CEO, but I fired myself as president <laughs> and became CEO. And, and, and reality is, let me tell you a little bit about our organization. Um, I'm here in Long Beach. The company is headquartered in Hanover, Pennsylvania. The president is in Stockholm. The head of product is a German guy living in Baltimore. Um, I hire the best, and we collaborate on Skype. We use technology that allows us to communicate all the time, and we have the most awesome team, and we're not the traditional company, and you, your generation has the opportunity to work on projects anywhere in the world. I know because I do that, and I work with people anywhere, and uh, you know, it, it, it's a very exciting time. And it, it, titles don't matter. We're all, because we, we, anybody that's, that is hired at Emico, you need to completely trust that they're doing what they need to do because they're off somewhere doing their own thing, but everybody looks at the projects with a different lens. So when we're all together, focused on that one project that we do every year, we have the most amazing team. And when I walk into Milan, and this stand is set up between our people doing communications and people working with press and the people doing the, the, the product. And the, it, it, we, we blow away the really big companies because we're, so, we're just so in sync. Um, and that's taken years and years and years to do. And that kind of work, you know, I think in today's world, it's so easy to get distracted we haven't gotten distracted. We just have been kind of head down, working on the same things. And I know you have these classes that, I had a guy call me up. I was at Cornell talking to the architecture students. And he called up and he said, um, he emailed me, can we talk? I said, sure. And he said, you know, I wanted to see if you would mentor me. And I, after three years, I've decided I don't like architecture. And I wanted, I, I love music. I want to do music. I want to do music, but I want to build environments with music, like little architecture with, with. And I said, okay, well, I don't really quite understand what that means. So help me understand. And I said, who, who would this be for? And he said, I'm not sure who it would be for. And as we talked, I realized he had no clue what he was talking about other than he liked music and wanted to do something else. And he had a bad day that day in architecture because architecture is so hard. And, you know, this, it looks like fun. It's been fun, it's been incredible, but I have to tell you, there's so many times where it just isn't fun, and it's, but my, my input to you is, when it's not fun and it's really hard, that's the time to stick with it. Because you keep at it and you keep going, you'll get there, it just takes time, and this, architecture student, my, my recommendation was stay in architecture and use this as your hobby and, and play with it until you really have it formulated, but keep up with that architecture. So, you know, I think it's a matter of just persistence in anything you're working on, really having the confidence to keep going and, and pursuing it would really be, a, I think, a, a great thing because there's so, it's so easy to find and shift shift uh, gears so easy. Anything else? Oh, yes. Just with the, the, the quote about making something so well you never have to recycle, like is that something you still try to push, like even though you're using recycled materials, like yeah. you still don't want people to, 
You don't want your chair to disappear and then be recycled. Right, right. You know, could the lights go on? Because this projector is kind of bugging. Um, the question was, um, make something so well so you don't have to recycle again. Uh, with different materials, I mean, it's hard to make something that's going to last as long as this chair. But when we made this chair, this, this, was, this was sort of, this was like the bar. We said, okay, let's do it as the best we can. And when the engineers first came back to me and they said, Greg, we could do this chair, but we have to mold it in four pieces. And again, I know, the more pieces there are, the more problems there are going to be. I said, won't work. We've got to do it in one piece. Came back and said, okay, we figured out a way and we could do it in three pieces. I said, won't work. Got to do it in one piece. Uh, came back and they said, There's, it's absolutely impossible to do it in, in one piece, but this, the mold on this chair is as big as a car. I mean, all these parts pull out of it. It's just gigantic. It's, it's, it's a nightmare to work with recycled materials when, you're, when you have the expectations I have. And the expectations are, make it as durable as you possibly can, give it the longest life you possibly can, and y you produce something. But, I mean, if you go through this chair and you, and you touch it and you feel it, it doesn't feel like a plastic chair. We worked on the texture. We worked on having colors that weren't about trends. Every single aspect of this, every detail has been gone over a million times. So it's not about how many could we sell. Because if we wanted to sell a lot of these chairs and make a copy of that, we'd make it out of uh, virgin polypropylene. We'd, we'd crank it out like crazy. They wouldn't last very long. But as a company, we'd make a ton of money. But that's not our purpose. Our purpose is, how do we use this material? And the engineering's harder. The tooling's harder. It takes longer to mold. It's, it's, using recycled materials is it's just a lot harder to do. The, yes? Do you still surf? I do. In fact, two weeks ago, I, my daughter's in school up in Northern California, and she surprised me and took me to a, this cool place called Bolonis? Bolonis? Bolinas. That's it. I, I was in Eves Bihar's office, and he said he has a little house up there. And um, that was really fun to go surfing. And, uh, you know, so I don't get out as much as I'd like to, but I still go out. And that, that goofy picture of me on a paddleboard with the, the chair, there was a, a photo shoot. Um, Emogos kind of gotten to be, you know, important in Europe. And so they wanted to do a photo shoot, and they sent out a crew, and, and the guy wanted to get me doing some sport. And I said, only if I could be sitting on my chair. And so it was kind of a goofy thing. So I did it. And um, more questions? Yes. Have you ever thought of using alternative um, materials like mycelium? What is mycelium? I obviously haven't. Yeah. <laughs> Mushrooms. Yeah, it's a really cheap material, but it's mm. incredibly strong and lightweight. Huh. No, it sounds, th that's the kind of thinking we need. I mean, where, where someone comes up with something we've never thought of before. And if you as designers, there are a million old crappy companies out there making toxic products. This is, this is your opportunity. Find the next mycelium or whatever that is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's brilliant. That's the kind of thinking that, that America needs, that the world needs.